always been faithful. Has Jesus always been faithful to you? Sometimes it doesn't feel like it. He's always faithful. Let's start with a word of prayer. I'm going to kneel. If you, if you would like, you can kneel or not with me. Dear Heavenly Father, as I, as I give this word from you, from Jesus, this letter from Jesus to each and every one of us, I would like you to anoint my tongue with coal. May the angels surround me as I preach. May the Holy Spirit come inside of me. And anything that needs to be changed, you change it, Lord. I'm just a messenger. Help me to be loyal and faithful to your message and prepare the seed of everyone's heart. Rain your Holy Spirit on us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, good morning. Do I have it on wrong? I did. I had it on wrong. Sorry about that. <laughs> there we go. Well, happy Sabbath, everybody. Thank you for coming to church today. I've actually been coming here on and off since 2013. And a lot of you don't know, because my husband's more of an introvert, but he got baptized here in the late 90s. And he, he was an assistant youth director with Pastor David Johnson when Pastor David Johnson was here. And um, I came here to do my internship from seminary and uh, got pregnant with the boys and went to our church. But then when I had the boys, I was like, it's too far to go. So I came back here. I became an elder. We moved to Los Angeles. And what do you know? My husband gets a job here. He brings us back here. So me here for a reason. Um, today I stand here to share a letter from Jesus to you. Let's dive right into it. I'll be reading both from the New International and the Message version today. The quotes from my favorite author Ellen White are always in, the Bible quotes from her are always in the King James Version, um, but I'll be quoting Ellen White as well, because I can't do her spirit-filled words just any justice with my paraphrasing, right? And just so you know, the message is a translation done by a Presbyterian minister, scholar, and theologian, Eugene Peterson. It was approved by over 30 scholars, and the reason I chose this is because uh, Biblical Greek and Biblical Hebrew are both storytelling languages. So he brought it into contemporary English because the meaning of each word is just so much deeper than what you see on the surface. All right? So the main verses for today come from Revelation 3, verses 20 and 21. I love this promise from Jesus. He says the following, Look at me. I stand at the door. I knock. If you hear me, If you hear me call and open the door, I'll come right in and sit down and supper with you. Conquerors will sit alongside me at the head table just as I, having conquered, took the place of honor at the side of my father. That is my gift to the conquerors. How awesome is that? Can you imagine having a dinner date with Jesus? Today we're going to talk about Revelation 2, verses 7, 11, 17, and 29, as well as Revelation 3, verses 6, 13, and 22, because Jesus repeats the same advice in all of these verses. And whenever Jesus repeats himself, do you think it's important? Yes. So Jesus says, and I quote, the one who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
But I love the way the Message Bible puts it. Are your ears awake? Listen. Listen to the wind words, the Spirit blowing through the churches. And that is just what Jesus is doing. He's walking alongside these aisles. We don't see him, but he's here. And that Holy Spirit through him is blowing through the churches wanting to enter your heart. Today, we're going to learn that when we put God and his word in first place in our lives, guess who's going to attack? That's right. The devil will attack. But thank God for his word and the promises in his word because that is our protection against his lies. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. In God's word today, we'll learn that the church is filled with sinners, including ourselves. I'm sure that most of you already know that. (laughs) But with the help of Jesus, our Savior, we are in the process of transformation. And with his help, we can win the battle that we have been fighting with our own flesh for so many years. Let's read Revelation 2 and 3 so that we can understand. Jesus is trying to reveal to us, okay? You see, the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ to us. It's a book of hope and a book of warnings. It's the opening of the prophecies from the book of Daniel. The book of Revelation is the revealing of God's truth to his people from the last part of earth's history. It's also a guidebook in developing our characters for eternal life. Amen. In chapter 57 of the book, Acts of the, Apostle, Acts of the Apostles, pages 583 to 585, my favorite author Ellen White says, This revelation was given for the guidance and comfort of the church throughout the Christian dispensation. Yet religious teachers have declared that it is a sealed book and its secrets cannot be explained. Therefore, many have turned from the prophetic record, refusing to devote time and study to its mysteries. But God does not wish his people to regard the book thus. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Blessed is he that readeth, the Lord declares, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. I testify, she quotes from Revelation 22, verses 18 to 20, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. And from the things which are written in the book, he which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. In the revelation are portrayed the deep things of God. The very name given to its inspired pages, the revelation, contradicts the statements that this is a sealed book. A revelation is something revealed. The Lord himself revealed to his servant the mysteries contained in this book, and he designs that they shall be open to the study of all. Its truths are addressed to those living in the last days of this earth's history, as well as to those living in the days of John. Some of the scenes depicted in this prophecy are in the past. Some are now taking place. Some bring to view the close of the great conflict between the powers of darkness and the prince of heaven, and some reveal the triumphs and joy of the redeemed and the earth made new. Hi, Jordana. So great to see you. (laughs) Um, Let none think, because they cannot explain the meaning of every symbol in the revelation, that this, 
that it is useless for them to search this book in an effort to know the meaning of the truth it contains. The one who revealed these mysteries to John will to the diligent searcher for truth a foretaste of heaven, will give, sorry, uh, these mysteries to John will give to the diligent searcher for truth a foretaste of heavenly things. He will give it to you if you are diligent. Those whose hearts are open to the reception of truth will be enabled to understand its teachings and will be granted the blessing promised to those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep these things which are written therein. In the, in the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. Here is the complement of the book of Daniel. One is a prophecy. The other is a revelation. The book that was sealed is not the revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel relating to the last days. The angel commanded... But thou, thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. That's the last verse in the book of Daniel. It was Christ who bade the apostle record that which was to be opened before him. What thou seest, write in a book, he commanded, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, and Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven right hand and the seven golden candlesticks this comes from Revelation 20 the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches okay so the golden lamb stands re represent what the seven churches right Jesus came to John on the island of Patmos where he was imprisoned to reveal himself in a message to the Christians that belonged to the seven churches in the province of Asia during that time. That's modern-day Turkey. The advice that Jesus gave them is the same advice that he gives to Christians that have come after John, which is Revelation's author. The advice that Jesus gave them is the same advice that he's giving to us individually. I'll explain this a little bit later. If you have a Bible or even a Bible app, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, in this Bible, it's page 1700. We're going to read it together to see what Jesus' advice is. Revelation 2, chapter 1, page 1700. Page 1700, and I'm doing this on my own so that I give you guys time to look for it too. Page 1700. Okay. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. 
says to the second church, the church of Smyrna, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. He says to the church of Pergamon, that's the third church. To the angel of the church in Pergamon, right. These are the words of him who has the sharp double edge live where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrifice to idols, and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The sword of my mouth. What is that? When somebody has a sword in their mouth, what are they doing? They're kind of they're rebuking you. So he's going to come and rebuke them. He, verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone. Thyatira, this is the fourth church. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead, then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, secrets sound like secret societies much, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Brothers and sisters, these are just some of the churches that were in Asia Minor during that time. Did you notice that none of these churches have all the characteristics of Jesus? They're like us, aren't they? Did you also notice that each church so far does does have at least one character trait of Jesus? As Christians... We have parts of Christ's character inside of us, don't we? But we also struggle with our sinful tendencies, right? Hope is that the more time we spend with God, the more we start to act like him. What I mean by that is that we start to reflect the character of Jesus 
which is basically the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Just like you act similar to or you start reflecting the thoughts of the people that you're around. In the spirit of prophecy, in the book Christ Object Lessons by Ellen White on page 41, she says, but Jesus did not bid the disciples strive to make your light shine. He said, let it shine. If Christ is dwelling in the heart, it is impossible to conceal the light of his presence. If those who profess to be followers of Christ are not the light of the world, it is because the vital power has left them. Something to ponder. If they have no light to give, it is because they have no connection with the source of light. I want you to ponder that when you get home. All right, let's move on to chapter 3 of Revelation, and that's page 1701 in the Bible. So I'll look for it with you again. <laughs> page 1701. Okay. Here we go. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come as a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. So just a little something on, on coming as a thief and not knowing. Um, if you have that connection with Jesus, you are going to find out his truth. You will be able to prepare for his second coming. I can't do that for you. I can just lead you to the water. I can't make you drink it. But I can lead you to the truth right here. And if you start studying that, you will be prepared. Jesus won't come as a thief. You won't be surprised but you, because you'll have that connection. Yet, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who ever overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. And your crown in Greek, the word, there's two different words for crown. There's the Stephanos, there's the diadema. In Greek, that's why I say these are storytelling languages, and they also have more than one word for what we only have one word for in English. So, take so that they don't take your Stephanos. The Stephanos is the victory crown, the, the kingdom crown. The victory crown is what Olympians would uh, get during the the times. So the Greek Olympians would get uh, Stephanos, which looked like a wreath. It's the equivalent of what Olympians get today when they get the gold medal. He, verse 12, 
Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The final church, Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold, for either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. A little story about that lukewarm. In New Testament times, when a guest came, they would, to honor their guest, if they were excited about the guest that was coming, they would give them chilled grape juice. If you gave lukewarm grape juice to your guest, you were telling them, you're not really that important to me. So I think that's what God is saying. He's saying, I'm not really that important to you. Are you giving him your best? Just something to think about. 17, you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Parents, do you uh, let your kids do whatever they want? No, you don't want them to be crazy. You don't want them to be rebellious criminals when they grow up. You don't want to be too hard on them either because the same thing might happen. But you discipline them because you love them, not because you really want, want to punish them, right? Verse 20, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Have you been listening? Did you find yourself in any of these churches? Is the wind, is, are the wind words of the Holy Spirit blowing inside of you? While preparing for this sermon, I noticed that there's a very special structure in this message, Revelation 2 and 3. In all of the messages, Jesus starts with a personal greeting to the angel of the church in right a personal greeting then he proceeds with the particular works of that church i know your deeds he knows you i know you i know my kids jesus knows his kids then there's a warning repent or else something bad is going to happen right next he makes promises to the one who is victorious, I will give. Or to the one who is victorious, I will make. There are different promises to each in each church for those who are victorious. I love that word, victorious, because it goes hand in hand with the, the, the Stephanos crown, the crown of victory. And finally... Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus concludes with this final phrase to all of the churches, and he repeats it seven times. This is his final warning. So the phrase is extremely important. The letter from Jesus has three different applications. Historical, prophetic, or symbolic, because Revelation is a symbolic book right? And finally, the universal application. In the historical application, the seven churches represent the seven churches in Asia Minor during the time of John. 
in the symbolic, the seven churches represent a specific period in time that corresponds to Christian churches throughout history. In the universal application, the seven churches represent each individual Christian person's character. And going back to the symbolic application, as we analyze time periods, you're going you're gonna to discover the transformation of the Christian church from the first century until now ends up being seven different time periods in Christian church history. Jesus mentions these, church, these churches in a very specific order because I think he knew that the different periods throughout time, that the churches throughout history would have these characteristics. He knew that. And the chronological order indicates that these messages had a much deeper meaning and a much deeper function than simply a message to the first century church. In the history of Protestant Reformation, Biblical scholars, that's someone who studied the Bible in an advanced academic level investigating for much deeper meanings and context. So they've noticed that starting with the Church of Ephesus and concluding with Thyatira, Thyatira each of these seven messages corresponds to the description of a specific time in history in the Christian church. And if you look up that, look up that, look up at that slide up there, um, that's from my studies in Revelation class with Don Dr. Ronko Stefanovich. I'm sure some of you remember when he was here about a year and a half ago. Stefanovich is a highly distinguished and respected biblical scholar who has specialized in the book of Revelation, for those of you who don't know him. And he says that, um, he explains that the Bible says that the church of Ephesus has suffered, been patient, and worked hard, for the love of God's name without fainting, but what God holds against them is that they've become loveless. They left, they left their first love. Okay? So even though false teachers were invading the church, they were faithful, but their passion toward God and toward each other, it was fading. They were becoming loveless. The church of Smyrna really has nothing wrong with it. God recognizes they've been faithful, like Jesus, they've gone through tribulation for being faithful to God's word. And they're, they're poor in money, but they are rich in salvation. Smyrna is a church that went through persecution. Biblical scholars discovered that Smyrna corresponds to the Christian experience during the Roman Empire, beginning in 2nd century until approximately 313 AD. Pergamum, the next church, retains God's name. And even though they live where Satan's throne is, they don't deny God's name. They don't deny the name of Jesus. But they have believers who haven't let, grow, let go of the doctrine of Balaam, the teachings of Balak. And these doctrines have become a stumbling block for the children of Israel. God's people are starting to eat things, sacrificed to idols. They're starting to commit sexual sins. And they have people who are still holding on to doctrines that they had as Nicolaitans. And I notice that Jesus says here that he hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He, Jesus doesn't use that word a lot. He doesn't hate a lot of things, right? But he repeats what he said to Ephesus, that he hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And the Nicolaitans were a Gnostic sect of Christianity that, Christianity that taught that it doesn't matter what you do, especially when it comes to certain sexual sins, it only matters that you believe in Jesus. In other words, the church is characterized by false teachers. So per Pergamum corresponds with the church from the 3rd century to the 5th century after Christ, following the conversion of Constantine, when Greek philosophies and other false teachings were invading the Christian church. Thyatira, the next church, has done a lot of great things. They're characterized by their works of love, faith, patience, and their latest good works are even better than their first ones. But God is upset because they tolerate Jezebel, who's calling herself a prophetess, but she teaches and she seduces God's servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. Next is the, is the, uh, the fourth generation that's characterized by the great apostasy. These are the... the um, Christian people that correspond to Thyatira. 
the fourth generation, which was the great apostasy from the Middle Ages up until the 16th century after Christ represents Thyatira. During this time, the Holy Bible was replaced with ecclesiastical tradition. Salvation in God through Jesus was replaced by salvation by works. And the great truth of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, was replaced with human works. They put an emphasis on the church instead of God, and the imperfect leaders of the church took the place of our perfect Christ. The church was used to provide forgiveness of sins and salvation for humanity rather than Christ's sacrifice doing that for us. Sardis. Within this church, Jesus has nothing good to say about them because they have a name that indicates that they're alive, but they are completely dead. There are very few people in Sardis who haven't soiled their garments or corrupted themselves. These people, Jesus says that they will walk in white garments because they're worthy. But the majority are dead, and Jesus is telling them, please, you need to repent. And Sardis is characterized as being spiritually dead like the fifth generation of Christians during the time of the Protestant scholastics following the Reformation of the 16th century. Many Christians during this time spoke about the former glory of the great reformers like John Calvin, Martin Luther, John Wycliffe, John Huss. They would quote them, but the purity of the gospel was completely dead. They were spiritually dead because they, fo they were focusing on philosophies. They were intellectuals. And the Bible talks about intellectuals. In Colossians 2a, it says, it talks about them as human beings with hollow and deceptive philosophies that depend on human tradition and elemental forces of this world rather than on Christ. So they were following in the footsteps of the Middle Ages. The Church of Philadelphia, this church is very pure. Like Ephesus, God has nothing bad to say about them. The church has been keeping God's word, and they haven't denied his name, but they're fainting. They have very little strength left. They've been persecuted by those who claim Jew to be Jews but are not. And these days, we would say those who claim to be Christians but are not. Jesus says that these self-proclaimed Jews are lying because they're not acting like the children of God. So Jesus is going to make these false Christians fall at the feet of the faithful ones, making them recognize that God loves and approves of them. So Jesus is trying to encourage these, these faithful Christians with the words, I'm coming quickly, hold on to what you have, so that no one takes your crown of victory, your Stephanos. And the message of the Philadelphian church responds to the 18th and 19th centuries after Christ. The period known as the Second Great Awakening. This was a reformation for the Christian church in North America, Western Europe, and South America, it was a period of revival. And during that time, Christians underwent several reforms. They established the American Bible Society, the British Bible Society, revivalist movements in South America. And during this time, a movement that began with William Miller. He was a Baptist farmer. He discovered a message in the Bible that pointed to the second coming of Christ. The Millerite movement impacted several Americans, including our religion. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church came from this movement. Finally, we have the Church of Laodicea, the second church. By the atmosphere of the city, feeling rich and rich and without any needs. But Jesus said to them, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They think that they can see very well, but they are completely blind, spiritually anyway. These are Christians struggling with their own identity. They love their worldly lifestyle, but they also go to church. God is not number one in their priorities. The church of Laodicea corresponds to the Christian church today right before the second coming of Christ, we are complacent. Now, the prophetic application is only significant when we have an understanding 
of what went on, of what went on in history to the Christians living in John's time. Did you know that there were more than seven churches in Asia Minor? Yeah. If you go to modern-day Turkey, there's, um, there, there's Colossae, Milatos, Troas, Hierapolis, for instance, and they had the same problems. But Jesus addressed seven churches. The number seven is very symbolic. It represents perfection, fullness, completeness, totality, and universality. And this is why God chose the seventh day and not the first or the sixth for us to honor and keep holy. In Revelation 1.11, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches that are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, John didn't write seven, he did not write seven letters on seven scrolls. He wrote one on but it was to be read by all seven churches from Ephesus to Laodicea in chronological order because the application was to be a universal application as well. Universal application because all Christians in Ephesus were not losing their first love. Some may have been going through persecution like the church in Smyrna. Some in Ephesus may have been in apostasy like Pergamum and Thyatira. Christians in Laodicea and other churches may have been missionaries like Philadelphia. You see my point? So all seven messages needed to be read by each individual church so each person could apply it personally, which is why it was just one letter and not seven. Listen, listen to the wind words, the spirit blowing through the churches. Every one of these churches has the light of Jesus. I know this because the Bible calls them, se calls them seven lampstands of Revelation 1, but they are growing dim. If you notice, Jesus keeps walking among them anyway, like the appointed priests in Israel, making sure that the light in the lampstands in the holy place of their tent, tent temples never went out. That's what the Israelite priests did. For 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the priests, would take turns assuring that the seven lampstands in the temple would never go out. Jesus is doing the same thing for us. But notice Christ's warning in Revelation 2, verse 5. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. He doesn't want to do this, guys. This is what happened to the people of Israel. Do you think God wanted to remove his lampstand from Israel? Do you think he wanted to, uh, that he wanted to just use somebody else? He chose Israel, but they kept rejecting God. They rejected their Savior, and their light, their spiritual light anyway, was So Jesus continues to pursue and warn because he doesn't want even one to be lost. But time is running out. Jesus is wanting to keep your dimming lights on. But if we keep rejecting his truth, our lights will be snuffed out. If you reject what I'm telling you, you're not rejecting me. You're rejecting Jesus' personal letter to you. I am just the messenger. These messages were created by God so that we would understand the correlation of Christian history as well as the personal application for each individual Christian, but be very careful. They were not given to point the finger at others, but to recognize yourself in them. You may not be the last church, Laodicea, but you may identify with Ephesus or Thyatira or Philadelphia. I have to keep in mind that Jesus wants to speak to me 
as he wanted to speak to the Christians who lived in the cities of Asia Minor during the time of John. Jesus wants for each one of us to experience salvation. But who has an ear to hear what God's Spirit is saying to you? Who's listening to the wind words blowing through the churches? Are we recognizing ourselves? This is the answer that we have to find personally and individually. Next slide. Who wants to receive the promise of Jesus in this slide? Read it with me. The promise of Jesus is Revelation 3, verses 20 and 21. Let's read it together. Look at me. I stand at the door. I knock. If you hear me call and open the door, I'll come right in and sit down to supper with you. Conquerors will sit alongside me at the head table just as I, having conquered, took the place of honor at the side of my father. That's my gift to the conquerors. Amen. What rest. Open the door of your heart. Listen to what Jesus is saying. He wants you to go to heaven and have dinner with him. <laughs> That's his promise. That's so beautiful. I remember when I was in seminary, I would get really lonely sometimes. And on Friday night, I would have a date with Jesus. And I would be I, I would make something, and then I would put something out for, for Jesus. I had such a wonderful time, and I couldn't even see him, but I felt his presence. Can you imagine seeing him and actually being in his presence? How awesome. He just, we're all in the same fight. We all want to see the same Jesus. We all want to go to the same heaven. We all need to ask the Holy Spirit to not just dwell in our hearts, but to reveal the plan of God that he has for us individually, that he has for our families, for our church, and to not let us darken his light with our opinions or traditions. Let's help each other to reach that goal that Jesus promised in John 14, 2-3. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Who wants to receive that gift? 